there was like a skull left at my house in like highlighter it said God hates and I was like, okay, I kind of need to take a step back because this is like scaring me. Oh shit. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Visit betterhelp.com slash Padilla because sometimes existing is exhausting. And if you wanna watch this episode completely uncensored with no ads and no sponsorship, click the join button down below to become a member and support this channel. But before we get into this episode, I wanted to let you know that we just premiered a new show called Assumptions yesterday on this channel featuring trans athletes. It's a lot like this show, but instead of me sitting down with the guests, it's the guests all sitting down and speaking with each other and facing assumptions that they hear about themselves every single day. So don't forget to check that out after you watch this episode. First, let's hear from Joey Graceffa. Hello, Joey Graceffa. It is me, <laughs> hello. I felt like I had to say your full, your full name. Yeah, which is a little, which is a little strange because we we were roommates at one time. Like, yeah. that's how close, I don't know if close is the right word. It was like strange because we were roommates that like were scared of each other. Yeah, I was a little scared. <laughs> Why was it? So wait, this was 10 years ago. Oh my God. Right? 10 years ago, 2013. Yeah. yeah. Where's the time gone? Uh, I, I don't Holy. know. Holy, okay. I don't know, but we haven't aged a day. No. Not gorgeous. Gorgeous. Sickening skin. S sickening? What pores? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so we were both daily vlogging at that time. Also, which I think I don't know, I think I was always stressed because more and more responsibilities with Smosh, I was like, sure, I will daily vlog every single day. Yeah. And that's totally healthy to not have a single moment for yourself. Every single moment is captured and presented to an audience. Yeah. You know daily what that's vlog like. Yeah, daily vlogging takes a toll. And it, once you're in the like machine, it just like becomes part of your everyday life. Yeah. And like I'd get that question all the time. It's like, how do you daily vlog? It's like, honestly, like once you're in the rhythm, it it's easy because it's just part of your life, but it eventually catches up to you. Yeah. That's when you really just kind of like burn out. How long How long did you daily vlog as, you know, you, your life, you're the on-screen persona? Think four or five years. Oof. Yeah. Oh my no. God. So that's like, that's like what, 1600 vlogs? I'm not very good at math, okay? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I think like there's like a blessing and a curse that comes with it because for one, it's like it's pushing you outside your comfort zone because you're like, I have to do something fun and interesting for the right. content. Yeah. And it like gets you out of your comfort zone to go out and do fun things. But yeah, it comes at the cost of like you're giving your everything that mm -hmm. you feel towards the end, you have nothing left to really give. How much did it eat at you? I think it was because I shared some like really intimate things. I think honestly the point where it got too much for me was when I started having people show up at my house oh. and it got really scary because there was like an incident where there was like a skull left at my house that said like in like highlighter, like on the skull, it said, God hates f And I was like, okay, I kind of need to take a step back because this is like scaring me oh, now shit. to the point where like I'm being like hate crimed for oh, presenting so much of my life. And yeah. I was like, yeah, maybe like, I I can't do this anymore. How soon after coming out was that? It was in that year oh. when I came out. You were not open about your sexuality for a long time and then you, you finally get the confidence to do so. Yeah. Which I thought your coming out video was really cool. It was a music video. Yeah. You know, thank so you, you. you got to you got to express yourself in an artistic way and you got to do that while also it was like, oh yeah, and also gay. <laughs> well, I wasn't even like expecting that to really be my coming out video. I was yeah. like, you know what? I'll just like have this be a hint that I'm gay. What, kissing another man? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I just, don't know just kissing a man on the lips, just a little hint. <laughs> just, just, a little, a, just, just a little hint. I was like, a lot of people won't get it. No, <laughs> I was not expecting that. I was like, and then I can come out with a video that's like a real like normal sit down video that I had seen other YouTubers do. Um, Cause 2015 was like the year of like the coming out videos, 2014, yeah. 15. And I was like, you know, I'm gonna one up these twinks and I'm literally going to create a masterpiece. <laughs> I sat down with YouTube and I said, we're gonna make history. And then you're, you're displaying all of your close relationships on camera, do you have any room to have private relationships? That was definitely something like throughout the entire process of being a YouTuber that like, 
I was so conscious of, I would always establish a relationship with that person outside of just putting a camera in their face. But for the most part, like if I wanted to maintain a friendship with someone, I had to make sure that I wasn't always recording with them every time we hung out. Um, Cause I didn't want to feel like I was using them. Um, and like there genuinely was a relationship. It's just like the thing I hated most about vlogging was that awkward, feeling of not knowing if they thought that I was just using them. Would you like ask permission to include yeah. people in your daily vlogs? I would, I always do. Like I'll, if I'm vlogging anything, I'll always ask before I like just take out a camera. Cause I yeah. feel like some people will just like take they out will. their camera. Around that time, especially yeah. people would just be like, um, I just daily vlog. And if you hang out with me, that's what you're in for. Yeah. You so signed up for this. I always ask before I take out the camera, like, is it okay if I vlog right now? Yeah. And yeah. if they say, no, then I don't. I think it's really interesting to talk about, but uh, when you blocked that guy's driveway. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my so, God. So you, you parked somewhere in LA, you, your car was blocking a very good portion of someone's driveway, and you were vlogging the whole time, and you're like, oh, where did my car go? I guess it got towed, shit. It turns out there was this guy that you know owned I guess owned the property that you you parked in front of. Mm -hmm. He looked in your passenger window. Mm -hmm. He saw was it tax documents? Yeah, I'm a dumbass. Yes. I literally <laughs> left my tax folder on my passenger side seat and I didn't realize that my tax guy literally wrote on the outside of the envelope like how much money I made, how much I owed, and, and my your full name. name. Yeah, my full so, name. So this guy looked up your name. Mm -hmm. He like did a YouTube search for your name, found that you were a popular creator. He saw the vlog yeah. that you made where you were talking about, uh, oh shit, what? I, I barely was in front of this guy's driveway. Yeah. I guess it, it got towed. He took it personally. Yeah. Even though he didn't mention any names, obviously. He like took it so personally. And then he made this like response video, bitter video, exploiting and trying to farm your fame for views. Yes, that was shocking. That was not fun. It was like the first, it was probably one of the first like YouTube burst scandal things. But yeah. like, I was like, this is so ridiculous. And I'm getting mass amounts of hate from Reddit. And it was like very toxic things. And like, from my perspective, obviously, if I had known I was blocking a driveway, right. like completely, I wouldn't have like made the video. Like I would have taken responsibility. I just assume like, how would I be so dumb to literally block someone's driveway? And it was so unintentional. So I vlogged that and I'm like, where'd my car go? Oh my God, I can't believe it got towed. <laughs> yeah. And so then when it came out and he had picture proof that I was fully, fully blocking, blocking, it made me look so dumb and it that I was like, lying. It looked like you purposely blocked it almost. Like, <laughs> yeah. you're like, this guy. Yeah, literally. I was getting this mass amount of hate and I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna address it at all. Did you not mention it at all at the time? No, not at all. And that's gotta be annoying when someone makes a video trying to farm views. Yeah. And you're not giving them what they want. They want the back and forth. They want yeah. like, they're almost setting you up in a position where because they have no notoriety themselves. If you say anything, it exactly. legitimizes, it legitimizes. The, the circumstance. But also, he brought up my tax information and that's he literally where it did. drew the line with me. I, I was like laughing watching his video. I was like, oh my God, like, I can't believe I did this. And then I was like, wait, now you're coming for my income and exposing like how much I owe in taxes. And like, it was almost like doxing me at that point. Like you took it a little too far, like yeah. now coming for YouTubers and how much money they make and diminishing my work. Yeah. And like saying that I don't deserve to make that amount of money. You know, I just bring that up as an example of how daily vlogging came back and bit you in the ass yeah. because he was able to find that video where you vlogged about it. Yeah. And he was able to paint you to look like a massive idiot <laughs> yeah. because apparently you didn't know or I, I don't know, but like he was able to have that evidence and try to build upon you're vlogging. No, for sure. And I didn't want to give him that attention and I didn't. So what is it like <laughs> having the pressure of so many people on you all at once, you know, and, and realizing that some people were even uh, championing your downfall? That was like a really big moment where I, I realized like who my true friends were and who I couldn't trust. And like, it kind of just became a huge wall went up. And I was like, whenever I meet people at VidCon or out in social things, I was like, the guard is up. I don't trust you. I don't know you. I only trust the people that I've known and like 
already trust. And that came from initial times in this space, you felt like you could trust everyone in the yeah. community. Well, it was like such a community driven thing that we were all supporting each other at the beginning. And it was mm -hmm. like when someone had a project come out, it was like, oh, we're all like rallying behind this. And then as soon as like people were rooting for my downfall, I was like, oh, okay, something, something's changed here. What draws you to create? You know, it's not just it's not just about getting that YouTube bag. No, it Unless, is. Oh, it is. Okay. No, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mm. hate my job. Mm. It's just all about the money. So, what draws you to create is being rich. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> uh, no, I think it's just honestly, I've always loved creating. Like since I was like a kid, I was always making home movies. So it was like it was just innately in me to want to like record things. And I just kind of fell into documenting my life that it just became a way of expressing myself that I hadn't been able to. Like growing up, I was so quiet and shy and like wouldn't even talk to like my friends about what was going on in my life. And then suddenly I had this camera and I was vlogging and I was able to like express like hardships that I had faced that like I'd never said to anyone, but here I am telling the internet like my most deepest, darkest secrets. And so in like a weird way, it was like a therapy session of just getting my thoughts out to the world because when people would respond and relate to me, I was like, oh my God, I feel seen and heard. Mm -hmm. And it pushed you further to be honest with yourself, to yourself as well? Yeah, definitely. Do you think that you would have, I mean, you would have eventually come out regardless of if yeah, you had YouTube. No, for sure. It was just nice that I got to have that moment because I went on tour right after my coming out video came out and like so many kids were like coming up to me and telling me like they'd whisper in my ear and they'd like come out to me mm. in my like ear and I'd be like, oh my God, like this is a lot. But it's like to be the inspiration that I wish I had um, was a really cool full circle moment. Mm. So in a sense, you were being who you wish you had as a role model or inspiration yeah, when you were younger. Exactly. I almost wish that we could go back to our younger selves and show ourselves where we are now. I, I don't think that I would believe this. Yeah. I don't think that I would believe that I'm where I am now. I know, it's crazy. Do you think you would like see yourself now and be like, yep, I see the path there? Yeah, that is so interesting. And I think that's a good perspective to have is to like really be grateful for where you are and how far you've come. Cause I feel like we're, all, we're constantly chasing and it's nice to like think back and be like, wait, the life I have right now is actually exactly the life that I wanted as a kid. So why can't I be grateful for what I do have as opposed to like constantly thinking, what's next? What else can I achieve? Do you find yourself kind of trapped in that? Like what's next? I need yeah, to be doing more. Definitely. And I've been doing this practice like every single night where I like write down three things that like I have now that I once wanted mm. and it's like really helped me become more grounded and in the moment and like really uh, feeling grateful. And as a reminder, we just launched our new show Assumptions yesterday on this channel. We covered trans athletes and we got to hear them face all the assumptions that they hear every single day. And I'd like to introduce you to Nicole who is producing. You've been producing for this show for a while now, yes. but now you're taking on this new show. Hi y'all, I've been behind the camera at Press Like for years now. You were also in front of camera. Yes, I've been in an episode in the I Spent a Day with Trans Women episode. Check that out, but sex, we all love it. Or do we? That's something you might assume or make that assumption mm -hmm. because asexuals might compare it to cleaning a toilet where there's a lot of fluids and it's just a menial chore that you have to do. In two weeks, we'll have three asexuals sit down and challenge your assumptions about them. Yeah, and some of these guests were on I Spent a Day with Asexuals a couple years ago, so it's gonna be really cool to catch up with them and hear how they interact with each other, what kind of conversations they have when I am not part of it. Totally. I thought I learned a lot about asexuals when I had them on this show a few years ago, but this gets so much deeper. I mean, like, where do you feel like you are in your ups and downs of your career right now. It's so weird because like, I have this like pet channel that I do a lot of rescuing and fostering mm -hmm. that's very successful and like I love to do. Mm -hmm. But for some reason in my mind, because it's a secondary channel, it doesn't feel as much of a success. My main channel, like I'm still figuring out what it is that I want to do on that channel. 
Um, and I think I've kind of found something that I'm like super into, um, but it's now reestablishing a new audience which I like look to you and I'm like, oh my God, like it's so impressive to see how you've been able to pivot and change to this and it becomes so successful. Like, what was that terrifying at first? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I spoke to you, I think either right before or right after I left Smosh. Yeah. And did I tell you how scared I was about how I didn't know what the hell I was doing? Yeah. And I was like trying to comfort you because I was like, yeah. you are like, anything you do is going to be great. Yeah. But like when you're in it yourself, it's like you can't really see outside of what's going to happen. I, I don't know. Spoiler alert. It was not good. The stuff that I was making right afterwards was not good. <laughs> it was me floundering around. It was me being like, I guess I create comedy, so I'll do this. But like on my own, I, I had millions of people watching me kind of try to like understand, find myself yeah. and fit into something. And the views had to drop so low that I had to just be like, Fuck it. I do not care. I'm not looking at the numbers. I'm not trying to appeal to anyone yeah. for me to find something that did end up working. The first video that I made when I left, you were in. Yeah. The it was your uh, it was me interviewing yeah. it was me interviewing other independent creators and saying like I haven't been independent in 6 years. How do I do this now? Mm -hmm. I did that video. I really like how it turned out and then I started doing all these other comedy type things and then I fell back on that style. That was really pushing myself outside of my comfort zone and that was probably the first thing that I did outside of Smosh that I felt like was a representation of uh, a little bit more of like who I am. But like I, as I started doing more interviews, the show has progressively evolved. I think as I've decided that I'm not trying to appeal to an old audience, I'm trying to appeal to who I am now and the audience will will find me. Yeah. But it's, it's, a, it's a scary period, especially when you have millions of people watching you fail. Yeah, or like adjust and like try and figure out like what it is that you want to do. Cause yeah. it's like, it's boring doing the same thing over and over. So like, there's going to be some shifts and like, you're going to want to try new things. And it's like really scary to do that in front of an established audience. Mm -hmm. Is that where you feel like you are right now? Yeah, a little bit. Cause I'm trying this new content that's doing well, but it's like one of those things where like, the views kind of like build. So like at first it's like, oh, okay, this video flopped, but then like two weeks later, suddenly it's like done really well. Mm. So it's like now figuring out this new YouTube algorithm thing. And <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's just scary to commit cause it's, I'm like all over the place. So committing to one style of content and I feel like everyone has to have like find their niche mm -hmm. and for me, that's always been hard. It's like this channel that was so focused on me and my daily vlogs is now becoming something not so focused on me. People watch your stuff and they've always watched your stuff to come out of it feeling a little bit better, a yeah. little bit lighter. I want them world. to feel worse after yeah. watching my video. Mm. Like I want them to cry. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And have, have a self-reflection of, yeah. of, of knowing that the world is a horrible place. And then I've done my work. Mm. You want the world to feel, you want people to come out feeling like the world is 2020 again. Yes. yes. I'm in my villain era. Mm. I've been possessed by a demon. Mm -hmm. Isn't it, wasn't that a shitty era? Definitely. I mean, I had a big transformation. I like broke up with my ex-boyfriend and kind of like, Refound myself. I mean, what was that like having that public? You're in a public relationship. You have a public breakup. I've been there. And people were so nasty, especially yeah. the gays on Twitter. They're the <laughs> worst. Like literally, so nasty. I'm like, I'm. We made a video like talking about our breakup, and then yeah. people. I was shocked at how nasty people are. They're like, why do we, we don't care. I'm like, first of all, this was not for you. This was for my audience that's been following our journey. Are they like, you're like, you think that you're so important by yes. making a breakup video? Yes. I'm like, I've been doing this for like my entire life, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And like, I've just documented the whole past five years of our relationship. And I, this is the finale. <laughs> this is our grand finale Damn, video. Your life is a show. Yes. One of the biggest things when I posted that I was going to be interviewing you, people are like, escape the night, escape the night, escape the night. You've released, was it three seasons so far? Four. Four seasons mm -hmm. so far. Yeah. I think I was supposed to be in season four. But you I were was supposed to be I in was in Japan. Four. I was living it up. Yeah. No, I would have chosen Japan over. <laughs> Where did the concept of escape the night come from? And this was funded by YouTube, right? Yeah. So it was... Um, do you remember? There was like this competing company called Vessel that yeah. was like trying to like 
poach these YouTubers to come to their platform. They were paying for exclusive. Exclusive, like exclusive window. Mm -hmm. Like post first on ours and then you can post on YouTube like a week later or something. I was working with a deal with them and then YouTube came in and was like, hold up, what if we gave you like half a million dollars to make a show? And I was like, okay, I'm I'm listening, oh, sure. Oh shit. And so. I didn't know you got half a million dollars to make Escape the Night. No, it was, it ended up being more. So <laughs> you're like, no, it wasn't that crazy. It was more crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I got this deal with them to like make this. And then they're for like, one oh. season for one season, but more than half a million dollars for one season. So what happened was they didn't have YouTube red, which is what it was called at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. It was just an anti vessel deal. Yeah. And so then YouTube was like, you know what? Actually, we're going to make YouTube red and we'll give you another million. So then Season five, COVID hit, but at that same time, YouTube had totally shifted their whole team. They got this new guy involved and we had a pitch meeting for season five. We had it all written out and ready to go. And to me, I was like, oh, it's happening. Like season five, like four was such a success, like it's gonna happen. And so we went into the pitch meeting, went, went so great, they were living. And like a week later, I get a call from my agent and they're like, so YouTube's not picking it up for season five. But I want to keep the story alive and I do have some exciting Escape the Night news. Tell us, tell us, tell us. <laughs> By the time you watch this, I guess it will be out. Better I'm... be out, because I'm not editing it out. Oh gosh, okay. The pressure's on. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to be crowdfunding uh, Escape the Night the movie. Yes. So I'm trying to raise a million dollars to make Escape the Night content and to make a movie is much cheaper than to make a season. Is it going to be fully scripted? A fully then? scripted. Okay, so it's like Escape the Night if it were fully scripted rather than having the voting out. It'll feel like a movie, but yeah. taking a lot of the elements from Escape the Night and what made Escape the Night like what it is, but turning it into a fully scripted format. How is creating Escape the Night on your own independently going to differ from working closely with YouTube and you know other production in that area? The only difference is YouTube was paying. <laughs> so, so they didn't oversee, they weren't like yes or no to your no, ideas? No, I had oh, full, full final say. When you make the announcement for the crowdfunding, how yeah. much are you revealing? We're filming a lot of content as like promotional images and video that will um, have like aesthetic vibes of what are they're going to see. Are you self-funding that element? Yes. Yeah. Um, definitely calling in a lot of favors and that will almost like guarantee people like spots in the movie when it gets made. Well, we'll, we'll put a link uh, in the description of this oh, video for, for anyone interested in helping out, potentially locking in one of those producer roles. Yeah, we love sugar daddies here. <laughs> sugar daddies, sugar mamas. So if you want to be a sugar daddy to me, hi. <laughs> when this gets funded, do you think it will invigorate some kind of excitement in you to, to, to be more of a producer, creator, writer? Yeah, it's something I've always been passionate about like that's like the end all be all like for me is to just live in a storytelling world where I can just tell my stories so I hope that this leads me in that direction. Hey I mean you're you're talking about how cool it would be to be able to just like dip out work on something drop something yeah. when it was ready. I could see a future for you where you're able to you know work on Escape the Night uh, annually and drop drop one every year and kind I of be able that. to dip in the back and just work oh my on behind God. the scenes. Okay, we'll come back to this in yep. five years and I'll be like, damn, we manifested it right I saw there. it, I see it, I see it truly. It's wow. unfolding right now. Whoa, <laughs> oh shit, that twist was insane. <laughs> A lot of what people love about Escape the Night and bringing it just into movie form. So what are those elements that people love? Well, people love the fact that there's, kill it. Got him. Oh my God. Yeah, there was a death on camera. I'm sorry, this is now a snuff film. <laughs> oh my God. <sighs> I mean, that was scripted and we just had a, a, it was CG. Yeah, totally. And don't forget to check out our new show, Assumptions, that we just launched yesterday, the first episode with trans athletes. So don't miss that. And also in a couple weeks, we're gonna be having asexuals on and you're not gonna wanna miss that either.